I was in Goa a few years ago, uh, staying with my good friend, the late fashion designer Wendell Rodericks. Wendell was uh, a gold legend and a national treasure. He remains one of India's only two designers to have been awarded the Padma Shri for reviving his work in the Kudli Sari. In one of the evenings, he hosted a dinner and much of fabulous Goa was invited. David Dhawan was shooting a film at Down, and the film stylist had brought over a couple of actors for the party. One of them was Siddharth of Rande Basanti fame. He is a Tamil and a Telugu and a Hindi film actor. He welcomed him and he said, uh, I don't know who you are because I don't watch Hindi films. And Siddharth gave him the most beautiful reply. He said, that's okay. I know who you are. We all wear clothes. <laughs> this happened more than 10 years ago, but I can still hear Siddharth's voice as clearly as if it were last night. We all wear clothes, he said. The answer became the answer to all the existential questions I had about my profession. Why am I, a sensitive, erudite chopper in my English literature masters, writing about fashion? Why am I, a furious, feisty feminist, writing about fashion? Because we all make clothes. We may dismiss fashion as something practical or something frivolous, but it's actually quite the opposite. It concerns all of us. Clothing is beauty. Clothing is self-expression. Clothing is road fix. And in the land of Mahatma Gandhi, clothing is also so, so political. We fought for our independence on the back of our clothing. The father of our nation told us to make our own clothes, to spin our own cotton, to weave our own cloth. Throughout the British and the looting of our money, they called our cotton white gold and turned it into factory made goods and sold it back to us with a giant tax. They actually sold to us what we had produced. And at that time, almost 40% of the world's wardrobe was made from India's cotton. Gandhi said we will make our money ourselves, we will keep our cotton at home, make our clothes by a handloom, and be completely independent of all rulers. Textile became a symbol of protest and obviously of national identity. Clothing became political. Guess what? It worked. A piece of cloth got us our freedom. Gandhi's dream was self-reliance and economic sustainability. His dream was to create jobs for India's poor. He famously said, if the village perishes, India perishes. Gandhi gave us our first lesson in supporting local businesses and homegrown luxury. The clarion call for Swadeshi was firmly entrenched in developmental economics. Buying local and supporting our rural economy was Gandhi's dream in alleviating poverty. 77 years after independence, in 2024 today, this still remains India's dream. 77 years after our independence, this remains an ongoing economic struggle. Never mind our growing number of billionaires, we are also increasing our numbers in hunger, and of those who are chronically poor. Data of what constitutes our poverty line keeps changing year after year, and the last time I checked, which was 2017, that's the last time we had any data of how many Indians were truly poor. But the World Bank gave us a report in 2020 uh, telling us that our poor had doubled in that year, in the COVID year alone, and according to the same report, 60% of the world's poor lived in India. This means we are poorer than most of Africa. I started writing about India's relationship with cotton and its environmental and economic impact very early on. I think it was 2013, and I wrote an article about how 99% how of the world's cotton farmers were exploited. Only six countries in the world grow cotton. That is... Uh, India, China, USA, Pakistan, Brazil, and uh, Uzbekistan. 
and each one is trying to outdo each other in making cheaper and cheaper flour. India actually has more land devoted to growing cotton than any other country in the world. Our cotton bowl, that is Maharashtra, Madhya Pradesh, Chhattisgarh, uh, Karnataka, is mired in debt. It's also called India's suicide bowl. In Gujarat, the cotton farmers say that they receive 13 rupees for every pair of jeans that is sold for 1500 rupees in the shops. I cannot write on fashion anymore without writing about India's farmers, weavers and artisans. I cannot write about fashion anymore without writing about hunger and poverty. In India, our clothing, our fashion, ties us to its dark underbed, to stories of exploitation, poor living conditions, poor wages, cheap labor, and unsanitary working conditions. India is getting richer because our poor are being kept poor. This erudite, sensitive, feisty, and feminist in me made me ask a lot of uncomfortable questions to myself, to those who I interviewed, and to those who built businesses in India. Talking to key designers and Indian entrepreneurs, I understood that much of gorgeous, glamorous India was built on the gaping divide between India's middle class and its impoverished. When COVID struck, we sat in our air-conditioned rooms reading about those who had to walk through two or three states to get to their homes. It was heartbreaking. These are our people, these are our citizens. These are people who take care of us in multiple ways. These are people who make us rich. India's poor are always kept away from sight. In cities, they live in ghettos. Our slums are cordoned off from public view. We may see them at traffic lights sometimes, and often we turn away. But these are people that feed us. These are people that clothe us. These are the people who we owe our existence to. During COVID, I started asking more uncomfortable questions to the fashion industry where I come from. What is the difference between a designer and an artisan, I asked. Just one, where he's born. A designer is one who can afford an education and a social network. An artisan is one who cannot. This was awful and it triggered me to start a fundraiser, but one that was sort of close the gap between the designer and the artisan. I wanted the designer to pay full proceeds of what he sold, of, of the garment's price to the artisan, not just a small part. So I started Baratri, an e-commerce sale where designers would donate their leftover stock from the pandemic, and I would sell it at full price, and the full proceeds of which would be donated to select artisans or artisan clusters. This would be their seed funding. They could feed their children, they could buy a new loom, they could buy a motorcycle or a better smartphone that took better pictures. They could find their own marketplace and they would not have to be dependent on somebody to bring them work. I called a wonderful lady called Tina Tehliani Parik. She runs India's first designer boutique and I told her I wanted to do this. That call lasted five minutes and she was in. Then I called the movie star Karina Kapoor and I told her I wanted her to be the brand ambassador for Baratri and to amplify my voice because who listens to journalists, right? That call lasted five minutes too when she was in. Lastly, I called my friend Parina Thapar, who is a brand evangelist, a great communicator and a strategist, and she was golden too. Baratri, which means brotherhood, or a town hall where ideas are exchanged, was born. Within a week, I had 110 designers sign up to donate their gorgeous couture gowns. It became India's largest fashion fundraiser during the pandemic, and we repeated it, and we would repeat it, and it became this fashion journalist's purpose. Because I have a dream, my dream is Gandhi's dream, my dream is India's dream, to alleviate poverty, to abolish hunger, to wear local, and to buy local. There are a clutch of wonderful Indian companies that share this dream too. I think some young Indian brands, some small brands for sure, are creating outstanding products that can compete 
with international uh, products and they actually created out of our villages. These are hardly craft emporium style items. They're just worthless goods. And it's amazing that they're made entirely in India by a social enter enterprise or craft entrepreneurship. I would say they even win the battle hands down. So many of our Indian fashion designers are a prime example. Some Indian designers have truly brought attention to what our villagers can do. Among them, among the finest is Rahul Mishra. Uh, he has been showing at the Paris Food Couture Week for six, seven years now. Rahul has initiated the idea of reverse migration and I don't know any other fashion designer who has shown commitment to rural development like he has. Over a decade ago, he found migrant embroiderers living in Haravi, which is Asia's largest slum. There were a dozen in a tiny room, living in squalid circumstances, only so they could earn a pricey Mumbai salary. Rahul sent them back home to their villages in Bengal and paid them, and continues to pay them city salaries. He told me, I asked him why did he do this, and he said that if a person lives in a city and he makes 10 lakhs in the city, he will bring his whole family from the village to the city. But if he makes 10 lakhs in a village, he will employ 10 other people in the village, the milkman, the carpenter, lumber, bricklayer, and sort of revitalize like the village economy. Rahul's hero was a poor weaver from Chandeli called Hukum Chandra Kohli. Hukum became very popular because Amir Khan and Karina were shooting three idiots there and they had visited his house and it sort of became a tourist spot and that's how Rahul heard of it. In 2013, Hukum loaned Rahul fabric worth 10 lakhs, which allowed Rahul to go on and participate in the International Gulmark Prize. It's a very prestigious award, Karl Lagerfeld and Yves Solaro have won it before. Rahul says Hukim Hukum became his first investor. Rahul's latest investor is Reliance Brands, a company owned by Mukesh Ambani and run by his daughter Isha. And Rahul never forgot Hukum. By the end of 2013, Rahul gave Hukum enough work and enough pay so that he could afford a flat screen TV. By 2018, Hukum opened his own company and brought himself a Marathi desire car. Hukum, who could only write his name in Hindi, is now an entrepreneur, and Rahul says, this is my India. In the early days of Black Me Fashion Week, we would have one day of the week that was called Textile Day, and it was dedicated to designers who mainly worked in textile. Today, you can hardly talk of Indian fashion without talking of its dependence on craft, all of which comes out of India's villages. Designers such as Anita Rora, her label Perro sells to a few hundred stores in Europe. Uh, she works with villagers in Himachal and elsewhere. Rina Singh of Eka, Gaurav Kanicho, Samitra Mondal, Himachal Shani of 11.11, they've all dipped into India's spinning wheel roots and woven gorgeous contemporary fashion. 11.11 is a terrific label that makes only hand-spun, hand-woven clothes. They sell extensively in Japan. They use a lot of something called gala cotton, which I really love. Um, it's the greenest cloth in the world. It's a short staple yarn that doesn't use any water, irrig any irrigation water. It's only rain harvested and it's completely pesticide free. 1111 pays great respect to the artisan. They make jeans and they have the artisan's name embroidered in, in Hindi on the pockets. Uh, they're also coming up with a QR code system that any consumer can just scan it on their phone and any garment. And you can understand the history of any garment, like the weaver's name, the dyer's name, the printer's name, even the farmer who grew the fabric for the cotton is um, God. <laughs> Sanjay Garrett of Raw Mango, whose outfit I'm wearing today, is my personal favorite. He refuses to call himself a fashion designer. He says he works in textile and he calls himself an artisan. He grew up in a small village called Mubarakpur in Rajasthan and started making uh, pop colored, psychedelic colored chandiri sarus uh, and showing them at Billy Hart. 
He was spotted by a dalal of Buddha who picked up everything and started selling his saris at his stores. And what a gorgeous label Ramango is today. But Sanjay tells me even today he calls up call centers to practice his English. <laughs> <laughs> Buddha has taken India, India's craft and turned it into a luxury product. I don't know if many of you have heard of Arahu Coffee. It's a social enterprise that works with tribals in a Maoist Red Corridor in Telegram. Um, it works like almond milk. It's a cooperative. It doesn't employ the farmers, but it partners with them. Uh, so each farmer is given an acre of land uh, to grow coffee in, and they sell it to Paris to fancy cafes in Bombay and Bangalore. And it's won every top coffee award there is internationally. It also supports something called regenerative agriculture, which means they change the top soil to a carbon-rich compost and they can thus grow the world's finest coffee. So yeah, that's an outstanding product. Very much cheese is another. Two friends, I think they're both architects, they got together and they bought some cows. They gave the villagers of the Rima village in the Rakhant a cow each to raise as a pet. The villagers can keep as much milk as they like to use and then uh, these two friends, they buy the rest of the milk and they make the most outstanding cheese there is. I don't know if you've heard of Jaipur Rugs, but they work with a few thousand villagers and they are India's big, biggest carpet exporters. I visited one of these villages called Aspura in Rajasthan and the lives of the women carpet weavers, most of them are women, uh, the carpet weavers, their lives have changed. They make about 25 to 50,000 rupees a month and they work from home. Okay. These are stories of wonderful founders, all of whom shared Gandhi's dream of living and working in India's villages and making India the global superpower it can truly become. Thank you.